thank you for uh, joining this particular video and uh, we have uh, many participants requesting more of the questions about VMware and uh, we decided to put on all the questions together in a single presentation and provide it to you uh, with all of its answers so we thought that would be very useful for all the participants to know how to begin and where to begin what to study and what to refer to and let's get started most of the uh, students or the participants who wanted to learn about VMware wanted to know first of all like what is VMware and why is it so uh, important for me in my cloud computing career and how do I start off with and there are several other set of questions we have just collected some of the very important questions from all the participants and we decided to make a single session out of it and so this particular agenda covers uh, what is VMware first of all just tell me like what is VMware and then we will move on to uh, VMware on AWS Right. So how, how does it actually work and uh, how do we actually install VMware and how do we learn? That's one of the questions from the partners. We decided to answer towards it. And uh, there are some questions like why VMware environment does it really require patching and how do I start off with? Should I use Workstation or Oracle VirtualBox? And there are other questions as well in the phase two that we are going to do. So what is virtualization and what are the types of virtualization that's so far uh, available and how it is actually being used in the market? And also we would like to discuss about what is a hypervisor uh, that is uh, being available in the market and what are the types of hypervisor that's used in the cloud computing model uh, so far in the market. And uh, we will also have a small demonstration using the uh, VMware workstation or an Oracle virtual box to see how a virtual machine is created and how a virtual environment can be used for a study purpose or maybe used uh, for other testing purposes. So what is vSAN and what is VMware ESXi? All right, so vSAN is uh, and we'll see uh, how what is ESXi and uh, how to install the VMware ESXi software and uh, okay so we we have also have a question how to install the VMware workstation on a Kali Linux so this is going to be for the lab purpose for any student that would be helpful and uh, we also have a small virtual machine creation and uh, management uh, discussion uh, and then uh, we'll also see the procedure how the VMs are getting backed up and restored and how is it so possible so this particular thing I wanted to tell uh, this is one of the content that can be discussed uh, with anyone who is uh, are willing to learn uh, VMware virtualization, uh, very especially system administrators and uh, new learners with basic computer knowledge can also understand because we are going to start off with very basic and this will be very useful for the beginners as well and where to start, how to start and how to start installing and uh, where to refer and all those information. So to start off with the very first question, what is VMware? Just tell me first what is VMware and how does it actually relate to cloud computing because when we say cloud computing there are several market leaders in the cloud how does VMware actually relates to it okay so uh, VMware related to cloud computing in both the ways which means you can avail VMware services as a cloud service but, and also you can set up a cloud for yourself with the VMware products customizable isn't it so easily available right so uh, with which uh, learning VMware products will make you a giant in the uh, cloud computing place. Uh, you can also set up a cloud, you can also avail cloud services and be an administrator for yourself on the cloud and it can be like vice versa any, anywhere and anytime. So uh, to start off, VMware is just an organization. They wanted to uh, create a set of software products and these software products are uh, mainly concentrating on the virtualization solution. So when we say virtualization solution, we meant like abstracting a hardware and creating a software out of it and making use of the resources efficient. So that's what virtualization is. So uh, to understand more of virtualization, we have done another uh, session where it will cover virtualization is all about. Right? So uh, virtualization solutions can be in uh, ways like uh, for the servers, for the network and for the storage, a a anything that's on the data center. So uh, that's what VMware is mostly concentrating on. And they are also into cloud automation. They also provide uh, work, uh, workplace services and mobility and they, they have acquired Harbin Black for the security. Uh, with all these in together plays, VMware can form a base products for all the cloud computing needs. 
for the modern era. Not only this, it is also a, so concentrating more on the Tanzu mission, which is going to be the next big thing for the cloud computing space, where uh, virtual machines, virtualization is uh, going for the next level called containerization, where we are going to use virtual machines and also containers, which is going to meet the customer's demands. In those way, we are going to have application modernization with VMS Tanzu mission. Uh, the mission is called Tanzu mission. It is going to handle all the containerization workloads on the VMS space. So this is all about VMware. It is a leading market software provider, not only on the private cloud space, but also it can uh, help you to set up your own on-premise cloud. It has several set of products, including data centers, virtualization network, virtualization storage, and the cloud automation as well. Uh, here I have mentioned uh, one, uh, some of the strings, but uh, VMware is doing much more than this. For concentrating more on the cloud space, I have put down all these things, but if you, uh, if you search more for it, you can get a lot of products that VMware is currently working on. So this is not limited to this, but we have more content. So now we know what is VMware. So we, it's time to know what is VMware on AWS. All right, fine. So everyone would have uh, heard about AWS, which is Amazon Web Services. Uh, it's one of the major cloud service provider in the market now, right? So the, uh, they, they they offer public cloud spaces, public uh, public cloud services. But you cannot have AWS uh, software on your own premise data center to set up an Amazon based on premise data center. But VMware is offering you that. But on the VMware on AWS space, we are going to see like, uh, why, why is it so necessary when I can do a VMware on premise data center? And if I want a VMware cloud services, I'm going for VMware cloud. But why is it so necessary for VMware on AWS? That is where the trick is actually. So many customers are willing to migrate workloads between VMware Cloud and AWS. Some customers wanted to expand their data centers, but they don't want to, to put on infra cost, so they wanted to go for the public cloud. But they have an on-premise data center already on the VMware based uh, on-prem DC that's running. So in those situations, they don't want to go for a, se a separate new public cloud. But they they uh, get a specific infrastructure from AWS where they can run the VMware engine and get connected to it. So in that way, AWS have a special engine for specifically for VMware, where they can have the vSphere products like VMware's ESXi. This is a VMware's specific hypervisor, whereas AWS will not use ESXi as its hypervisor unless and until it's the VMware special engine. So they are going to use vCenter as uh, uh, the management. Uh, for the uh, VMware on AWS engine and vSAN and NSX as well. So this will form a, a software defined data center on the VMware on AWS engine and this can be used by the customer who wanted to actually establish a connectivity between his on-premise data center and the AWS where VMware is uh, managing the particular engine and this, this is easy for them to connect and migrate the workloads when and where necessary. So if in case they are going to put more workloads on AWS or more workloads on from DC, it is going to be very easy for them to get communicated. So they don't want to rely on both software products and their compatibility. This will enable the customers to easily opt for any uh, public cloud. So not only this, Google Cloud is also offering a specific VMR engine where customers can have any choice between AWS and Google. But on the back end, we have VMR's products. So which is again going to have a um, a uh, very good opportunity for the learners who are going to learn VMware. It is going to enable us opportunities even inside AWS and in, in Google as well. So they have administrators who are managing the engines of VMware inside AWS and Google. Uh, so this will enable the administrators to know more about it. So now I understood what is VMware and uh, I also know how how is it so important between AWS and Google as well. So now should I install it? Where do I install it and how do I start off with when you say lots of VMware products are there, how do I install VMware? As I said earlier, it is a set of software products so which concentrates more on server virtualization, storage and network virtualization. To start off with, any uh, data center requires server to be virtualized first. Only then they can go ahead and virtualize storage and the network virtualization. So server virtualization is the base I would say that that is going to have the core component like vCenter and ESXi. After then we'll go for the storage virtualization and network virtualization. So to learn more about it, the 
uh, the main streams are like server, storage, and network. There are separate set of courses offered by VMware and uh, the training institutes that will offer you to learn about uh, data center virtualization. So when I say data center virtualization, it concentrates specifically on the uh, vSphere uh, install configure manage. And for the storage virtualization, the product is called as vSAN, VMware's vSAN. And for the network virtualization, we call it NSX. So these are all the products and their related trainings and troubleshootings are also available on the market uh, for you to learn more about it. And not only this, we have VMware's replication uh, and uh, content libraries as well that will enable VMware to all round the software defined data set. So to start off with the uh, server virtualization setup, we should know how to install ESXi and vSphere because they are going uh, and vCenter because they are going to be the base uh, vSphere components that's going to form the virtualization setup. So uh, when I say ESXi, it is the hypervisor that is going to create the virtual machine and handle all the workloads. Though vCenter is a very important component, it is a management component, but ESXi is going to be the data plane component. When an ESXi is affected, our workloads are affected. But when the vCenter is affected, our workloads are not directly affected. Does the VMware environment need scratching? I wanted to answer this question. Yes, obviously it is. Yes, because any software does require enhancements for its features and uh, uh, to fix the problems that's in the current release, we have to patch the product. It is very important to patch the ESXi and its vCenters regularly so that uh, we keep the uh, systems out of risk and uh, keep them enhanced. So it's very important. They have several set of products from VMware to patch ESXi hosts, vCenters, and the appliances that's associated with it. Uh, very especially the ESXi host kernels and vCenters are regularly needs to be updated. So uh, for any uh, environment that has got multiple hosts, uh, the administrators are uh, uh, trying to upgrade the ESXi hosts, it is going to be very difficult, right? So uh, VMware offers a solution uh, that comes along with the vCenter server appliance uh, called as uh, uh, VMware Update Manager that, that is uh, by default running on the vCenter server appliance to perform the patching solution. So it is going to be very easy for the system administrators to patch the ESXi and the vCenters without any hassles. So, and now I wanted to set it up as a laboratory in laptop so I can run and then I can learn about it. one of the students wanted to know which one is the best VMware workstation or Oracle virtual box uh, because uh, some of them wanted to opt for it and then they wanted to install and learn about it right? so before we answer this question I wanted to actually tell you uh, about uh, uh, hypervisors because only when you know about hypervisors, you will not get this confused along with the ESXi. Hypervisors are of two types. One is type 1, that is the native hypervisor, which means this type of hypervisor uh, will directly get installed on the bare metal or a server hardware. These type of hypervisors are native hypervisors. Wherein the hypervisor that we are currently talking about in this particular slide is a workstation or a work virtual box or type 2 hypervisors and they require a host operating system to run on which means they cannot directly run on a bare metal so the type 1 hypervisor is ESXi hypervisor and type 2 is the VMware workstation or Oracle virtual box hypervisor for any type 2 hypervisor we need host operating system like Windows or a Linux to be relied for, for this particular software what they actually do they, they get installed on top of the operating system as in like a, uh, other software and then they abstract the resources available in the laptop and then they can create virtual machines on top of it. Define the virtual machines memory and the CPU for it. It will get it from the underlying host operating system with which it can manage the resources for the virtual machines. This is best for the students who are going to learn, create VMs and deploy the virtual machines and establish connectivity. But this is not suitable for the enterprise level applications. For the enterprise level we should use ESXi, that is a type 1 hypervisors. They can manage the workloads for high end models. Okay, moving on to the context. Yes, Oracle and VMware, as we know, they are one of the uh, market leaders in providing virtualization solutions for the modern IT industry. So, uh, this virtual box is a, a open source freeware product. Uh, but uh, VMware Workstation offers uh, a three-day trial only, but uh, it is a licensed product. So uh, for uh, for 
for those who uh, can afford VMware Workstation license, they can obviously go for it and it is going to be really worthy for you because it is going to have the same set of features and options that's uh, available in the enterprise so you can uh, you can correlate yourself and learn along with uh, like how you can learn the enterprise oracle virtual box is a bit different in terms of interface and appearance but it's going to give you a good amount of features like how the vmware workstation is providing so uh, i would suggest going for vmware workstation would be the better option uh, if you have the license and if you can afford the license but for uh, learning purpose, you can also use Oracle VirtualBox. What is vSAN? So vSAN is the product that's been developed and uh, available in the market by VMware for the enterprise class storage virtualization. So it is it is one of the storage virtualization technique used by uh, VMware. And this particular vSAN is available along with the ESXi hypervisor itself. So which means you do not need to buy a, uh, download a separate vSAN module to install, but it is coming along with the software product. All you need to do is just put a license for it and start using it. So it is so simple. It is just a feature kind of uh, enablement uh, and it requires an additional license, but it is so easy to configure and make use of. To understand more about vSAN, I have put down a picture like uh, you can see uh, usually uh, before vSAN, we have ESXi hosts, uh, several set of ESXi hosts in the market, and uh, uh, they will be connected to the SAN data stores. Uh, that's a big kind of storage array on the back end, and they will be providing TVs of uh, data stores to the ESXi hosts. While uh, vSAN wanted to minimize the use of, uh, uh, efficiently use the local hard disks of ESXi hosts instead of using the big storage arrays, they wanted to elaborately uh, use the efficiency of IOPS of the local disks. They came up with a, a disk pooling architecture. They wanted to disk pool all the local disks of uh, vSphere ESXi hosts and form together a data store that's logically a vSAN data store. When all these are combined, the IOPS are going to be huge and they can uh, sufficiently provide a software defined storage at the vSphere layer. Okay. So vSAN will simply abstract the underlying storage hardware or the disks into logical storage so they can form a vSAN data store for the virtual machines. It, it, it simply enables a vSphere to use the local hard disks of uh, ESXA hosts and it can reduce the cost uh, to a greater extent, which uh, which is going to be a good margin for the customers using vSAN. It is widely used in the hyper-converged uh, infrastructure that is in the market now, and it has saved the cost for a lot of customers. And uh, it is going to be uh, the next uh, changing model for the storage uh, in the market. For the vSAN, uh, we need a minimum of three ESXi hosts in the cluster and it is enabled at the cluster level for the hosts. They usually have a um, high capacity disk and a high performance disk formed together so that the, there is no compromise for the performance or for the capacity. So what is now ESXi? So uh, as we know, ESXi is a type one hypervisor and it is a native hypervisor. It is used directly on the infrastructure and the hypervisor will abstract all the physical resources and form the virtual machine hardware. With the virtual machine hardware, we can install the guest operating system and install applications on top of it. As you can see in the picture, we have three applications on three different guest operating system running on a single hypervisor. So this is the magic of ESXA, I would say. It can abstract resources and give virtual hardware for the virtual machines. It is customizable, easy and efficient. It is the base component without which virtualization is not possible and obviously cloud computing is also not possible. The same way other public cloud vendors does use different set of hypervisors but ESX is one of the hypervisors that's easily available in the market for the customers use as well. I wanted to know how do I install VMware ESXi. It is a very straightforward installation and it is more likely a Linux installation. So the image shall need to be downloaded from the uh, downloads page and needs to be mounted as a virtual image on the server hardware that uh, you are going to use. Uh, for installing the ESXA on a laptop for, uh, for study purpose, you can uh, download the image and uh, mount it on the virtual machine that you are creating in the workstation setup. For enterprise level, the hardware server hardware needs uh, to be booted manually or it needs an ILO interface kind of so that you can mount and then boot the enterprise level ESXA installation. ESXA can also be booted via network boot uh, or a boot from sign configuration 
whichever that is applicable and can be used in the environment for any esxi 6.7 that has to be installed we have a specific set of requirements at least 4 gb of ram should be available and uh, the server should be in the supported list that's available in the vmware's website and it should have um, at least two cpu cores for the server hardware and it requires some of the bias features to be enabled with especially the virtualization technique enabled for the esxi i don't have a windows laptop so i have to use the kali linux where i should install my workstation uh, is it possible yes it is possible and uh, vmware workstation is a type 2 yes we know that so we have to have a kali linux installed on the base and then we have a specific set of binary file that's available on the vmware downloads page that can be downloaded directly to your kali and then you can uh, change the permission and then you can start running as shown in the picture but the first thing is you need to connect it and then get your vmware.bin file downloaded you'll have to change it to executable and then you'll have to run the installer once it is successful you'll be able to create virtual machines you'll have to trigger the workstation with the command vmware so that the program get started and you can make use of it it's an evaluation product initially and after the trial period ends you'll have to license it how do i manage the virtual machines and things so i wanted to just uh, tell something about the vm that's actually the end uh, machine that's going to serve the purpose of having the application right so for creating a vm we need to have one of the hypervisor it can be either a type 1 esxi host or a type 2 workstation hypervisor anything so once it is in place we can just uh, create a new virtual machine and create um, a cpu memory for it whichever it is required it is customizable and it, uh, it can be booted with the same image that we are downloading usually for the operating system installation for any server piece or a laptop piece you can make use of it and then mount it with the iso virtual drive option you will have a virtual cd option uh, make use of it and then you can do it the, the virtual machines similar to uh, ser uh, servers or any laptops does have a specific set of bios configuration and it is stored as a file as you can see on the picture a virtual machine is a set of files that is created when you create a virtual machine so to manage it all we need to do is just modify the settings associated with it so once when you do it uh, the files get altered accordingly and that the a, a virtual machine will be changed here on the picture you see uh, i have put down an edit settings page where you can alter the network of the virtual machine instantly and this gets affected on the files on the back end so if you can see post creation of the vm it can be modified as many times as we need right so uh, this is going to be easy uh, for any administrator to change it and uh, we can uh, change it while the virtual machine is running this will also avoid operational issues uh, for uh, any administrator and the hot plug features are also available in uh, vmware where we can increase or decrease the cpu or ram while the machine is in production so the the same way network adapters will also allow us to change uh, from different to from or to different networks while the vm is powered on running so this can also be done as many times as we want and we can test it and we can run it while in the production it is not recommended to change the network but the option is still available if there is a network expert they can do it backup operation and the restore procedure of uh, virtual machines so when when usually in the physical architecture we'll have to uh, have a separate network adapter for the backup of process and then they will go via the network and it gets copied to the tape drive or any backup software but as virtual machines are so easy and simple to administer uh, we have the back backup and uh, restoring operations so easy in single clicks it, we have a feature in vmware called a snapshots with the snapshots the virtual machine's current state will be just captured as it is as an image and this image can be used by the backup software to to copy the running state of the virtual machine with the actual data so it is copied directly to the backend storage by the uh, software as you can see on the picture the avamar server is one of that and the, the clients will be the virtual machines and uh, the desktops are can be the virtual desktops they can be directly uh, copied by the avamar server to the backend storage the same way uh, we can also make the restoration as easy as creating a new virtual machine from an existing uh, image 
uh, with this, uh, I hope I have answered some good amount of questions and uh, we are going to complete this session. And thank you so much for everyone continue watching this. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please do let us know and uh, we'll be uh, ready to gi give you the answers at any time. Thank you so much. I'm good. Virtualization. So we wanted to know what what is the virtualization basically and how that is actually going to be implemented in the cloud computing market. Uh, how it is actually changing the market. So when when we say about virtualization, it is basically a technology that is going to uh, efficiently utilize the hardware. Say any hardware that is a, a server hardware or a storage hardware or a network hardware. So virtualization is the key technique. Like it is going to make use of the uh, hardware very efficiently, and it is going to use it 100%. Not exactly 100%, but fully utilize it, and uh, it, it turns re really into the cap it reduces the capex and the opex costs. Okay, so uh, I would like to start it from the picture that is uh, shown here. If you can see, there is a picture on the top uh, that says that there are three servers that uh, that is dedicated for each of the applications uh, in an enterprise, say a mail server or a web server, and a legacy application server that's running uh, almost like 30% utilized of its actual resources. Say, for example, if it has got uh, 100 GB of RAM and it is going to use only 30 GB of memory, where the uh, rest of the 70% is going to be idle, not almost um, uh, all the time uh, the 100% is being utilized. So in that way, so we are going to uh, lose some of the capex and the opex costs involved in the server hardware. Right. So uh, if, if we combine all together, the all the three servers are utilizing 30% almost uh, every time and the rest of the resources are idle though it cannot be used for the other applications. Even though if the mail server has got like 70% uh, available resources and the web is uh, using 100% at some times it cannot borrow the uh, resources from the mail server right so the, the same way it applies for all the physical servers and the uh, storage hardware a, a, everywhere so virtualization wanted to dynamically allocate the resources and uh, this is uh, I mean like can be done by means of abstracting the resources. So we are going to see in this particular video uh, how this is being done and what is the key technique behind this, right? So moving to the context over here, virtualization is the technology right, that lets you to create useful IT services using the resources that are traditionally bound to hardware. Very exactly, uh, if I speak about the server virtualization primarily, that says about the CPU and the RAM as its main resources that is bound to the server hardware. So in that way, if we create an abstraction layer, that is a piece of software that can dynamically allocate uh, software, I mean resources for the uh, virtual instances that's running on top of it, then we are going to dynamically allocate the resources. So we can push the resources and memory management can be done with the help of the abstraction software. So moving to the second point, it allows you to use a physical machine's full capacity by distributing its uh, capabilities among uh, many users or environment. So yes, that is how it is. So, so this is uh, possible by means of using the abstraction uh, from the hardware resources and giving it to the virtual environment. So uh, with an example over here, if you can just take three physical servers, servers uh, and they are dedicated for individual application purposes like mail, web and legacy apps over there as depicted. Uh, if you can see, one is a mail, other is a web server and the last one is the legacy applications. So they are about like 30% utilized and uh, with the virtualization, we can uh, split the server to have, uh, take one server hardware that was dedicated for the mail server, we can take that and we can use the abstraction uh, layer over there and put the hypervisor software on top of it and have two virtual environments running over there. Uh, one virtual environment dedicated for the mail server and the one will be dedicated for the legacy apps. So in that uh, way, uh, we have now uh, reduced the uh, cost of one piece of server hardware by means of uh, putting the resources of mail and legacy apps together on a server hardware. So this is possible by means of using the virtualization technique. If this is done all over to the server hardware storage in the network hardware, imagine about this software to find data center that we get as a final goal that is going to rule the cloud computing market. Right. So uh, with the fi final point, like with virtualization, you can split the server into two unique ones that can handle independent tasks 
so the legacy apps can be migrated yes of course so they, there will be two virtual environment created for one for the mail and one for the legacy apps so they need not to be uh, they need not have any confusion they will be having a separate virtual hardware and the virtual environment where they can run and they can um, share the server hardware without uh, themselves knowing that they are running on a shared uh, hardware resource so you can see on the box below i have mentioned uh, here with the virtualization technology the hardware can work with two operating system instances so for when creating a virtual environment one specific for the mail one specific for the legacy apps the server hardware itself will manage uh, with the hypervisor on top of it will manage creating OS instances with uh, different applications running on to them by sharing the resources dynamically uh, with uh, with knowing like what is the virtualization in mind we, we came to know uh, to an understanding that this is the uh, exact way of uh, abstracting the resources and efficiently utilizing them we would need to know what are all the types of virtualization can I just do only the virtualization on the server hardware uh, can, can that be done for a desktop no it's not that way there are several types of virtualization available in the market and there are pieces of softwares available to them softwares and products that is achieved through various vendors uh, can, can be done uh, and that can be implemented along uh, for the entire data center and even for the software and desktops that used in the enterprise market nowadays so with that in mind we have put on some types of virtualization and there comes the first form of virtualization is the data virtualization so when I say data virtualization how do you actually virtualize the data when the data is like huge and with the growing cloud computing market and growing world needs with the data being handled by the smart devices every software industry is go going towards a big data and no sql hadoop to handle big amount of data chunks that can be easily content delivered right so in that way data virtualization helps uh, the multiple sources of data to be handled by a centralized uh, virtualization technique so that is where we have the big data and no sql stuff the these form of uh, software enables the data virtualization and they keep tracking of this without having a single source and uh, they have a multiple source of information coming together and they will be handled centralized uh, the second one is the desktop virtualization when we say desktop virtualization how is it so possible say for an example a, a company has um, several amount of employees they, they have to uh, handle all the employees day-to-day uh, -day work through their desktops uh, when, when we virtualize this desktop there will be a centralized administrators sitting on the back end and every individual employees will be given a video a uh, machine that will be accessed via virtual remote operations and that, that will be managed by the uh, administrators in a centralized fashion say for example VMware VDI and Citrix Zen desktops are some of the examples that can narrate how these machines are actually virtualized and they, these are desktops that is virtualized and running on, on any other hardware of the company while their employees can can access them uh, using their uh, BYOD devices and uh, smart devices as well uh, and the next comes uh, server virtualization this is one of the very major and uh, traditional uh, like it formed the way from the uh, servers or how they are virtualized from the traditional methodology to the new digital era the server virtualization helped really a lot for the uh, enterprise markets and customers to reduce the capex and the opex costs this this server virtualization technique enabled the uh, applications to be migrated from the traditional model to virtual machine instances where all the virtual machine can be can have enterprise level applications running on a single piece of hardware sharing multiple uh, uh, virtual machines in a single hardware so this is done by means of using server virtualization technique and some of the examples that enables the server virtualization is the VMware ESXi Microsoft Hyper-V Citrix Zen server and Linux KVM these are some of the hypervisors we have other set of hypervisors also in the market but these are some familiar ones that is known and the next comes the OS virtualization so when when we say OS virtualization what does it actually does so which means whenever we have a virtual machine instance we are just going to share only the virtual hardware 
it. So they, they are sharing the server hardware, but every virtual machine will have separate operating system instances. Say for example, ESXi hypervisor is running 10 virtual machines. We have 10 individual operating systems. It can be either Windows or Linux running on the virtual machine instances. Uh, this will be an overhead on top of the ESXi to handle all the operating system threats separately uh, that is running inside the virtual machine instances. To reduce that burden, burdens further, all the virtual hardware that is having the operating system separately will be sharing a single operating system, a Linux or a Windows together and they will have a single operating system shared by all the virtual machine instances for example and there comes the virtualization of the virtual operating system for every virtual machines on top of the ESXi. This particular technique is called as containers where, where they just get the uh, separate uh, processes triggered for every individual part say called containers so these processes will act as containers they don't require a separate virtual hardware or a virtual operating system to run on they just spin as a processes on the underlying operating system itself so uh, one of the virtualizations is the network functions virtualization so uh, this will enable the uh, switches and routers in the environment to be uh, virtualized and the software piece that's running on the switches and routers can be run on a virtual machine appliances so that uh, any virtual machine running this piece of switches or router softwares uh, can actually perform the switching operation and routing operation so basically we, we do not require any switches or routers uh, physically to perform the operation and this can be done via a software virtual machine wherein we need only the physical connections between the uh, ESXi hosts or the physical hardware uh, using a fabric. In that way we can achieve the network functions virtualization using the piece of software installed on a virtual machine appliance. Now we know what are the types of uh, virtualization that's available. So uh, we, we would need to know what is a hypervisor so that we can understand how this is being achieved actually. So when we say hypervisor, the hypervisor is the piece of software that can actually perform the abstraction. So when I say abstract, it is going to take control over the physical hardware that's on the underlying and then it will start performing the managing operation. So it will allocate the resources in the uh, virtual, it will create the virtual environment, uh, it will create the virtual hardware for every virtual machine that's created on top of it. So it is going to take control entirely and then perform the operations. So moving to the context over to the slide, uh, hypervisors are software that can abstract the physical resources of the underlying system and divide them up in a way that the virtual machine environments can use them. Yes. So the, any virtual environment uh, is the virtual machine that we call can use the underlying resources through the hypervisor only. The virtual machine cannot directly talk to the hardware without having the hypervisor's intervention. So this hypervisor is also called as a virtual machine uh, manager. Uh, this is going to take care of entire resource allocation procedures for the virtual environment. Resources are partitioned as needed for the physical environment to them to as many virtual environments. So it is being partitioned by the hypervisor only. So it takes care of these operations. So uh, any users who wanted to interact with the virtual machine uh, will be doing it with the virtual environment. The hypervisor will be handled only by the administrators who are going to uh, deploy and uh, perform management of the hypervisor actions. So any user who is going to use the applications will be hitting the network of the uh, virtual machine instance or the virtual environment we call uh, through the virtual machines only and they will be interacting with the applications inside the virtual machine only. Uh, they, there is no need for the users to work on the hypervisor because hypervisor is solely a, a abstraction management component and it is relying on the management plane. So when, when a hypervisor is installed, it takes off the processes like a partitioning, isolation and abstraction along with the memory management techniques. So a, no matter what, which type of hypervisor it is, it is going to perform this uh, partitioning, isolation and the uh, resource allocation. Uh, by abstracting the underlying resources available for it. So based on the types of the work it does, the hypervisor is categorized into two layers, I mean like two types which we are going to see in the upcoming stage. So here we have um, the types of hypervisor. So it is very essential for any uh, person who is learning um, virtualization to know what are the types of hypervisors. So uh, we, we would come across such words like VMware ESXi or VMware Workstation, Linux KVM or an Oracle Virtual Box. I would need to know what are the differences between them and how do they actually relate to the enterprise and or to the actual work that we are going to do. 
right so based on this hypervisor uh, we have two types one is the bare metal hypervisor other one is a hosted hypervisor so as the name states bare metal uh, the this type 1 hypervisor can be installed directly on a server hardware so it does not require any operating system to be installed initially on the server hardware because the bare metal hypervisor itself does have a kernel and it can have the hypervisor software pre readily available uh, so it can uh, directly install on the hardware whereas the ho second type that is type 2 hosted hypervisors as the name says there it is hosted on a operating system so it relies on another operating system for it to run so it can run as a software wherein it doesn't have a specific kernel for itself to directly sit on top of a hardware so uh, whenever i install a hypervisor directly on a hardware i call it as bare metal whenever i install a hypervisor on a operating system i call it as hosted hypervisor that's the type 2 so if you ask me which one is good for the enterprise i would say bare metal hypervisors are the one that can handle the enterprise workload because it has got enough provisions to perform all the operations and management stuff wherein the hosted hypervisor is used for um, testing purposes or small environments or libraries or uh, study purposes hosted hypervisors can be used so if you can see bare metal hypervisors are capable of running directly on top of the hardware and are used in the enterprise level operation they they can handle huge loads and they have their specific kernel but in hosted they don't have a, a specific kernel and it relies on underlying os uh, like windows or mac to run as a software it is suitable for study labs and testing purposes so i wanted to continue the types of hypervisors so it will be very good to understand how the type 1 hypervisor is actually different from the type 2 hypervisor as you said it directly sits on the host physical hardware uh, in the picture on the right if you can see the physical hardware can be any server it can be a hp or a dell or any model of uh, physical hardware uh, that is available in the vmware's compatibility matrix uh, we can install any uh, esxi on top of any hardware so uh, not only esxi we have uh, uh, hypervisors available in the market from different other vendors like citrix zen server microsoft hyper-v and linux kvm uh, and oracle's uh, hypervisor as well so uh, here we mainly uh, speak about vmware esxi because uh, it is one of the market leading virtualization vendor and we are going to concentrate more on vmware so if you can see this hypervisor can uh, create uh, as many virtual machine instances depending upon the CPU and the RAM available. So if you can ask me simply, can I create 100 VMs on top of an hypervisor? I cannot answer it because it depends on the power of what you put on the physical hardware. If I have a, a 100 core uh, on the physical CPU that is having uh, that is being put on the physical hardware, I can give. Uh, hyper threading technology and then i can put as much virtual cores as i want but i cannot exceed the number of actual cores available on the underlying host hardware so in that way i uh, i can create as many virtual machine instances as i want but it is directly proportional to the resources physical resources available on the host physical hardware that is how the type 1 hypervisor is designed to work and it sits directly on top of the physical hardware it can it is bootable image available on the vmware website uh, it can be installed directly on the physical hardware. Moving to the context, this hypervisor runs directly on the host's machine physical hardware. So it is also called as bare metal hypervisor. That's what we call bare metal. It is installed directly on top of the physical server. So there is no operating system or any other software layer in between. Yes, it does not require any other operating system. It itself can boot and itself does have the kernel and the virtual machine management techniques. So type 1 hypervisors are very basic OS and uh, on top of it we can run the virtual machines so it can be used only for the virtualization purposes yes you cannot have any other softwares installed on the uh, hypervisor uh, it, uh, because it, it is used only for the virtualization purposes you can create virtual machines and perform the operations and you can have the additional features uh, that is being provided by the vendor uh, for the say hosts or any other the hypervisors that you are going to use but you cannot install any other software that you wish on the hypervisors because they are closed kernels uh, these hypervisors uh, require a separate management control to perform activities uh, like instance creation so when i say instance it's a virtual machine basically uh, it can be migrated or any other management operations specific to the hypervisor if i want to change the date of my hypervisor system or if i wanted to uh, collect some logs or if i wanted to change any configuration setting i 
I need a management console to hit my hypervisor. So my hypervisor basically has a, a network card and it is connected through an IP address uh, with a browser and from where I can access the hypervisor to change any settings, perform uh, its day-to-day -day management operations. The management console can be web-based, yes, of course, uh, or a separate package like a, like a piece of uh, uh, connection client that we can use uh, on any other uh, jump machine and then I can connect to it. So it can be in either ways, but it is very essential for the bare metal hypervisor to have a management console through which we can perform all the operations. It can be a web-based or any other. On the other end, we have the uh, type 2 hypervisor. Uh, the type 2 hypervisor is a bit different from the bare metal hypervisor where it requires an operating system to rely on because it itself does not have any kernel and it is a piece of software that is installable on top of the host operating system. The underlying operating system can be a, a Linux or a Windows or a Mac. It, it doesn't bother but it requires an operating system. So this type of hypervisor runs on the operating system of the physical host machine. They are also called as hosted hypervisors. So the, these are like you can install on the laptop. See if you can, if you can have a laptop of 16 GB, you can install a VMware workstation and create virtual machine instances of two or three instances with a good amount of RAM and boot them and perform a, a small setup to study about uh, virtualization or anything you want. So uh, basically some uh, testers or developers will use this to have a virtual environment uh, similar setup to run their codes and uh, debug them in a separate virtual environment. These hypervisors are usually used in the environments where there are a small number of servers. It can it can be used in very small systems and it can be used for very small setup or libraries as I said earlier can be used there. Uh, they do not need a separate management control to set up, uh, manage, set up and manage virtual machines. Yes, it's a piece of software. So the software itself has an embedded interface where we can have the uh, control of every v VM instances and together we can manage the software directly there. These operations can typically be done on the server uh, that has a hypervisor hosted. Yes, of course. The hypervisor is basically treated as an application on a host system. It is like like one of the software, like you use a MS Office or an Adobe uh, or a Chrome. It's, it's like one of the software that you are going to use, but it has got virtual machine instances running within it so we can use whenever we want. Uh, after this, we are going to have a demonstration of of, uh, how to uh, create a virtual machine and what are all the options available uh, with, with that uh, uh, we will be seeing uh, how the virtual machines are aligned uh, in a hosted hypervisor system so we will take a hosted hypervisor uh, say VMware workstation and create virtual machine instances and then we'll see how it actually runs and uh, we can see some options available in the VMware workstation and learn about. Now it is time for the demonstration. Uh, well, I have a laptop that has got 8 gigabyte of RAM and um, running Windows 10 operating system. So I plan to install a workstation 16 that is the latest version available from VMware, uh, which, is, uh, which is a form of hosted hypervisor. That So here uh, you can see the interface of a VMware workstation that is currently installed on my laptop and it is available for us to create and manage virtual machines. Uh, this is the home page. Uh, once the installation is complete, it is pretty straightforward installation as you can install a normal software. Uh, it can be installed and uh, I have installed the trial version. You can see on the about VMware workstation, I have installed uh, version 16 and uh, I have 30 days of uh, trial period available for this. So now uh, I'm going to create a virtual machine and show like what all the options that is uh, available for uh, any person to uh, create and play. Before this uh, virtual machine creation, we need to have a ISO image that is an operating system image that is uh, available uh, to install the virtual machine instances. So once that is available, I need to create a virtual machine by clicking on the create new virtual machine button over here. So once I uh, click that, I'll get a new virtual machine wizard and that wizard will guide us to perform the virtual machine. So there will be basically two options to uh, start off the new virtual machine creation. One is the typical, that is the recommended ones. So it is easy steps and the custom is the advanced. So you can select what are all the types of uh, disks that you can attach like uh, um, uh, independent disks and uh, controller types you can select and the network adapter types you can select. If not, a VMware workstation will opt optimally pick uh, a good amount of uh, uh, operations for you and it will make the steps easy. So let's go with the recommended ones and I will click on next. 
Nowadays we have uh, other options. Installed disk options is not available because I don't have any other drives in my laptop. If you have any CD drive available, you can also install the media from the CD drive. And the second option is the disk image file option that is ISO image. I have a couple of ISO images in my desktop. So uh, here I have Ubuntu and I also have RHEL 7 for my uh, lab purpose. So I'm going to pick RHEL 7 uh, for installing here. So once I select the ISO, you can see the Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux 7 64 bit is automatically detected. If I don't want to install any operating system, I just wanted to create a dummy virtual machine. Uh, rather, I can import any virtual machine from my friend's PC. Same. I have a developer friend. He has put some code. Uh, and packed it as a virtual machine, he can export it and he can give it to me. I can put that here as a virtual machine and make use of it. So if I don't know what is the operating system that I'm going to use, I can click on I will install the operating system later, which will create a, jump, a dummy virtual hardware virtual machine uh, from which I can edit this later once. I'll click on next and then uh, it will just ask me what is the name of the computer that we are going to give so I'm going to give like Linux PC and username will be like my name and I'll give a password so this password is for both user and root account so it can personalize your PC uh, post installation and then I'll click on next so it is going to pick a virtual machine name for me if I want I can edit it like a Linux PC testing and then it will uh, select a location where I can store the virtual machine files. So we will also have a look on what all the files it's automatically creating uh, post a virtual machine is created. So I will make a note of this. See users under my documents folder. I can see this. So I click on next. I leave it to default. And it has got some uh, uh, disk uh, capacity for me. And I am going to store it. Um, into uh, multiple files so it will be easy for the virtual machine the VMware workstation to handle it. I can also store it as a single file whenever I wanted to. This will uh, allow me to uh, operate the virtual machine easier. So I don't want to change the defaults. I'm going to go with the uh, recommended size of 20 GB uh, which is for the RHL 764 bit. And then we are into the final page so we can uh, see the name of the machine and where the virtual machine files will be located and which version of workstation I'm going to use, what is the operating system that I'm going to install and what is the uh, RAM, uh, hard disk and the CPU and the network adapter types. If I wanted to customize this, I can customize this hardware using this option. I can also do this post virtual machine creation. If you want to do this right away, I can do it. So if I want to add any other devices, I can add it here. You can see floppy drives, network adapter, USB controllers. I can add other options are also available. But there are certain dependencies accordingly. We have to select that. So uh, here by default, we have one USB controller already. And then we have one processor with two GB of RAM. It is auto selected for this particular type of virtual machine. It depends on the virtual machine type. If I select Windows, it is going to be different because Windows requires a different amount of uh, RAM and CPU and the uh, variable workstation will automatically pick it for you. If you want to change, you can do it right away here by uh, altering the sizes of the RAM. And I'm going to leave it to default because it's all okay for me. And once I click on finish, the virtual machine is getting created and uh, the checkbox will allow the virtual machine to power on automatically once it is done. So if I click on my computer, I have two machines. One is Ubuntu 64 bit which is already created. The Linux PC testing is just one that we actually created right now. This is creating uh, the creations in progress now. As you can see, the easy install has taken over, so it's going to install this for me, and I don't need to do anything further. It will automatically start installation. I also have a parallel Ubuntu machine that's running, and it is currently getting installed. Uh, I wanted to show this for the demo purpose. Ubuntu is getting installed automatically uh, using the Ubuntu image, which I showed earlier. Now we have another Linux PC. On the base, we have Windows 10 machine. Now I have different uh, flavors of operating system with virtual hardware here. The virtual hardware for Ubuntu um, is around, uh, I suppose, 2 GB. 
okay it's around 2 gb uh, for my ubuntu machine as well and i have two processors the same 20 gigabyte of hard disk for my um, ubuntu machine as well it's going to be the same for them and if in case i wanted to make any operations to the virtual machine i can simply right click on the machine and i see the available options over here so i have the power options i can uh, power this off i can um, suspend i can reset i can do uh, all the power operations here the removable devices are cd devices floppy all you can see over here even it detects the camera that's available on my laptop and it also um, detects the Jabra headset which I'm currently using it also have the sensors of my laptop I, I can directly connect the devices to the virtual machine uh, and and then I have the SSH option uh, I can configure the SSH from here uh, to the Ubuntu once it's available in the network I can take snapshots so whenever I wanted to say for example I'm upgrading my Ubuntu and I wanted to revert back to my upgrade I can use the snapshot option so further I have manage options this manage will help me to clone the machine if I want to give it to my friend or if I want to use it on another PC and I can see the delete operation I can change the permissions these options are available uh, some options are available only when I power off the machine say like delete options and I can download and I can upload it to another server if I wanted to uh, create a new ESX I say for example if I'm using a um, VMware workstation my startup company and I'm upgrading my company I can upload this to my ESX site directly from the VMware workstation for that we need the network connectivity and the microphone and this settings is one of the very um, important option where I can change the settings of this virtual machine over here uh, according to my requirement so this setting will allow me to change the ram cpu network cards all the display that we saw during the virtual machine creation apart from this we also have the options tab where we can see the working directory the virtual machine name all the um, advanced level of settings over here and we can um, make use of these settings whenever it is required so here we have many other advanced settings uh, like firmware type in some situation they want to UEFI secure boot firmware which can be altered and uh, several other settings so I'm going to see what is happening to my Linux PC it is getting installed uh, it is currently booted up with the image that I have given and I think it is going good with the installation so far without errors uh, because my laptop is of 8 GB and I have given 2 GB for my Ubuntu and I have given 2 GB for my Linux PC it is uh, quite slow but it is okay as you can see it is setting up the installation environment it is moving faster all the operations are taken care of by the easy install and I don't need to do any further settings and it will be up and running in a while So if you can see, uh, I, I need to use the virtual network editor to uh, create the networks, uh, the VMNet 1 and VMNet 8 as previously shown, those network adapters 
those networks that's already created will be visible to my virtual machine whenever I need to edit its network connection. So uh, I will open this virtual network editor again to show what are the networks that's currently available. There's two networks that's available by default. One is VMNet 1 and VMNet 8 uh, that can be used for my uh, virtual machine's network connection. The VMNet 1 is a host-only network type and the VMNet 8 is a NATed network type. These type of uh, uh, networks will be uh, available and can be used based on the requirement and we can have the subnet addresses changed according to our requirement. By default, this can be available on the settings of the virtual machines to make use of uh, those networks. If I want to create a specific network for my requirement, I need to first create that in the virtual network editor and then come here to the virtual machines individually and assign them. If I want a bridge network uh, where I need to connect the virtual machines network directly to the laptops IP, in the laptops network, I need to use this bridge option. So if I use NAT, uh, the, the virtual machine will have a separate IP address, but that will be using the host's IP address as its package source to send, send and receive the data. So when I use the host only, it does have a private network shared with the host, which means this particular private network will be available only within this laptop. So any virtual machine that I am going to create within this laptop will be able to communicate not further than that. I can also have a custom network creator for myself and here I can see, I can assign those networks over here. So right now, as you can see, VMNet 1 and VMNet 8 are the ones that's already by default created on the virtual network creator and it is available to assign. If you want to use a specific custom network, I need to create a custom network for myself. I also have the option of assigning LAN segments whenever it is required. These LAN segments should need to be created by already and then we need to assign them to the virtual machines. There are a lot of other options with this specific to the network that can be used. But I'm going to use the default ones as it is the preliminary setup that we are going to use. With this, uh, we have covered the virtual machine creation and the device operations, how the virtual devices operate and what are the files that's assigned to a virtual machine whenever it is created and how the virtual hardware is being assigned to virtual machines whenever it's created by a host or hypervisor. I hope we can answer more questions in the further more sessions and thank you everyone for having uh, spent your time on this particular session. Thank you.